Kiki's frozen and muted. Hi, everybody. <laughs> well, Kiki's figuring that like, out. Is that, I'm is say that hello. me? Well, because you were looking at her, but you weren't moving. So I thought you so were both I was frozen. Also, oh, man, she fully left. She's like, I've had it. Hey, <laughs> everybody. Out. This uh, is this week in much. science. This is um, you're watching the unadulterated, raw, live version of the show, <laughs> and so things like this happen sometimes. But um, if you listen to this later in iTunes or Stitcher or Spreaker or Spotify or wherever you listen to our audio, it'll be nice and polished. It'll be edit. I mean, it'll be edited. I don't know if it'll be nice yeah, and polished. But if it'll be edited. Uh, but if you're listening to this now, it's too late. You're in for the unedited. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Error but it's riddled like, it's version. It's like a secret. It's like shh, like nobody else knows, right? Yeah. So like everyone here knows about the unedited version of the show. Yeah. They never hear us talking about this Big kind of secret. This, this is the secret club. You're here. Yeah. You've done it. So Kiki will hopefully join us in a moment. <laughs> well, you can just um, launch the show. You know the things to say at the beginning, don't you? Yeah. I I feel weird Hi, starting everybody. without her without checking. I'm gonna text her. <laughs> You you do that. Meanwhile, twist. What episode are we? That can't. So episode first of all, you're clipping a bunch again, and also recorded Wednesday, um, November sixteenth. <laughs> Oh, oh no, I'm and you're also out. like it's so crazy six seconds the behind. Doesn't happen on my end. Like I can't see it. So that's so strange because I see you apparently reacting in real time. I think my internet needs to like warm up. It needs like okay. the first stay four when I, after I say three. Ready? Showtime. One, two, three. Four. That was like the count of seven. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's yeah, so you're wild. Because of course at this, this end like, I'm getting everything. This is like I'm talking to you on Mars right now. This is like a very long ping. Yeah. From this, it's wild because from this end, obviously everything's in real time. Every there's no you have no delay back. It's so it's not like a marine radio. Where I know that you're on delay. I can tell that you're on delay. I can't tell at all. You seem like you're responding to things. So in, in your experience, time. there's no delay. I'm just waiting for you on the back end. Doesn't make oh, sense. Oh, yeah. Oof. This is rough. I mean, refresh the page. <laughs> the page just got opened. There was nothing else open. <laughs> There was no, there's no other, the browser just got restarted, the computer got restarted, the Wi-Fi got oh restarted. God. So it's meanwhile, Kiki also told me to start the show, ways. but I don't know if I could do that where we're Without just going to be talking over each other literally the entire time. So maybe you should also restart or something, I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'll try to. You stay there. Don't go yeah. anywhere. Okay. And it's just me now. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I would love to start the show, but that seems silly. So I'm going to wait for one of the two to come back. Um, yeah. So here we are. Oh, okay. So Arn Lord checked, and he's three seconds behind. Okay. <sighs> well, let's see. I was going to show everybody... Um, I can show you all this while we're waiting. I have been hard at work on this. There's exciting news coming. Oh, here's Justin. Hey, Justin. Maybe. Hi. Is it working? Hi. Five, four, three, two. One. Oh, gosh. Now you're delayed. Five, four, three, two. One. Oh, it's better. I think it's better. Okay. Okay, let's let's start. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. This. We're gonna. We're gonna. We're gonna. This, you're gonna. You're gonna do it. <laughs> no, you do it. I, I don't have it up. Okay. All right. I have to. I have to open up the music. Because I just realized we'll I need that. that. In, we got. We'll do that in post. Okay. This entire no, no, I have, movie I have is going to be made in post. I have the controls, man. Why not use the We're gonna controls? We're going to sit around. We're going to do catering. We're going to take some breaks. All right, I'll get, we'll yeah, set up some equipment. But we'll actually put... The whole movie will be done in post. Okay. Don't worry about start. anything that happens here today. Okay. I'm going to start. I'm going to do my intro. You're going to do the disclaimer. Here we go. <laughs> this is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 901, recorded on Wednesday, November 16th, 2022. Will leprosy save our lives? Hi, everybody. I'm Blair Bazdrich. Dr. Kiki's internet exploded. I don't know. She'll be back later in the show. I'm really, I'm, I'm putting the positive mode out there. She will rejoin us. <laughs> and today we're going to fill your head with life, death, and deaf mosquitoes. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. This week, the President of the United States shared with the world how the USA is meeting the climate crisis with urgency and determination to ensure a cleaner, safer, and healthier planet for us all. First, the U.S. has joined something called the Paris Climate Accord and created something called an economies forum. So there's that. The U.S. president then went on to say that the administration would spark a cycle of innovation to improve clean technology, to accelerate decarbonization in other countries, to accelerate adaptation of climate-friendly policies, to accelerate action on climate, and that we all need to be accelerating our efforts to, and I quote, turbocharge the emer." the ener, the excuse me, turbocharge the emerging global clean energy, clean energy economy. Turbocharging, fun fact, is a way to burn more gas in an engine. Anyway, they said that this would shift the paradigm of the United States, that we're racing forward to do our part by driving progress in the private sector, by driving progress around the world. So much shifting, accelerating, driving, and turbocharged racing references in one speech. Somehow the President of the United States couldn't even figure out how to give a speech about climate without putting everything in terms of burning fuel in the combustion engine. The president then made the bold claim that the U.S. would reach a goal it set 17 years ago of cutting its carbons in half by 2030. With eight years to go, the U.S. is less than halfway to its target and, the, and is projected to lose much of that progress over the next few years as the economy rebounds from the pandemic. And all of this is focused on carbon reduction to maintain a 1.5 degrees Celsius global increase, which current research has shown is going to be more like 3 degrees if much more aggressive action isn't taken. Overall, it's great to see the U.S. president engaged in climate talks or giving a climate-focused speech at a climate event. But attendance alone does not get you good grades. If so... The hundreds of oil lobbyists in attendance at COP27 would get the same grade as world leaders. Come to think of it, maybe they do. One place attendance definitely does count is whenever you drop in here to hear another episode of This Week in Science coming up next. Good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone else out there. Thank you for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again to talk about you made science. It. We ready for this? So, yeah. 
so ready to talk about the science. Okay, well, this week, exciting things have happened, and I have stories about gene drives for mice, an Artemis update, and a brain router. Hopefully a little bit more reliable than the one that I'm working with currently. What do you have, Justin? I've got living longer with leprosy livers, the oldest cooked meal ever, ancient footprints, and just good news about global warming. Wee, just Maybe. good news. I can't wait. Blair, what's in the animal corner? I have killing mos mosquitoes the passive way. I also have twin fish and gay termites. Awesome. <clears throat> This sounds yeah. like a wonderful show. I'm looking forward to all of it. I hope everyone who's here is looking forward to all the science as well and all the discussion. And as we jump into everything, I just want to remind you that if you are not yet subscribed, we're all over the place. We are on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch, where we stream live weekly at 8 p.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays. We are Twist Science on Twitch and Twitter and Instagram. And we are uh, This Week in Science pretty much everywhere else. And you can find us all places that podcasts are found. And our website is twist.org if you have not a piece of paper to write all this stuff down on. And that makes it easier for you. Ready for the science? Bring it. Bring it! Okay, so my the first story I wanted to start out with tonight um, has to do, like Blair mentioned, getting rid of mosquitoes. We've talked about using gene drive to get rid of mosquitoes, where gene drive is a technology that allows us to modify genes so that you put in a certain gene into the genome, and then that gene is driven through the entire population so that it just, it exists all over the place. And that gene is, we've talked about in mosquitoes previously, meant to uh, stop reproductive capacity so that the population dies out because they can't reproduce anymore. Well, there is a study out uh, as of this last week in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences about a technology that they're calling T-CRISPR. And it was previously developed to target malaria producing mosquitoes, but this time they have targeted the house mouse in Australia. Mm. Yes. Why? Why? Because the house mouse is an invasive species in Australia mm. and is causing oh. all sorts of ecological problems. And so. <sighs> The idea is that in a place like Australia, we could use gene drive to stop reproductive capacity in a invasive species, an invasive, invasive species like the house mouse, um, and uh, then use it as biological control. We know how well biological control has worked in um, many other <laughs> previous situations. Um, but the the issue here that's very interesting is that this is the first time that they've been able to use gene drive to suppress reproduction in a vertebrate species. Previously, we've been looking at this in invertebrates, in mosquitoes. Mosquitoes who we go, oh, mosquitoes, they're awful, right? Even though we've had many different conversations here on the show about the usefulness of mosquitoes. Um, this particular modification makes all female mice infertile, so it could lead to great population control. However, um, this is a very, this is still just in the lab. They have not yet shown this as a possibility in the wild. And we don't really know how this gene will, whether or not it would succeed as well as it does in the lab in the wild, because that's a different situation. However, um, 
the researchers are saying the system is species specific because the house mouse only breeds with other house mice and not native mice, preventing ah, the spread of the system that between was species. One of the I was going to ask. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> that, uh, don't count on that. There's a lot of mice out there, and two mice mm -hmm. in the field, you just don't always know what they're going to be mm -mm. up to. Mm -mm. Yeah. So it's a uh, it's an interesting interesting question um, because they're looking at Australia as an island as opposed to mm -hmm. it's a big continent you know it's mm -hmm. yes it's an island but it's a continent um, yeah. uh, and even though we might be targeting a species on an island somewhere island species are often very good at traveling well, many species yeah, they like, have to be because how'd they yeah. get there it's How like, oh, I mean, you don't place. have to worry about this because this uh, this mouse won't end up anywhere else. Well, how'd it get there? It's an invasive species. It if was carried, there, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> it snuck aboard something. <laughs> it just snuck. It just, you know, it was a sneaky little mouse. It was cute little mice, you know, that get in there. Anyway, interesting uh, conundrum. Um, gene drive in vertebrate species for the first time. So, don't like it. Yeah, what do you think? Don't like it. Like when they were targeted mosquitoes, you're like, ooh, I hope nothing bad happens, but you know what? Even if something bad happened, it'd be worth it to get rid of the mosquitoes. Even though right. they're pollinators, uh -huh. it's just, just, they just have a, a, a awful way, awful manners. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> they take meals where they're not offered, right? Yeah. They, they, uh, uh Gosh, mice. So, you know, but then this is, this is, I can, t we can all talk all day about a problem that we're not dealing with, mm -hmm. that somebody else is taking too drastic a measure to mm -hmm. counter. Mm -hmm. But if it's destroying wildlife, fauna, fauna there, if it's ruining crops, if it's invading homes, if it's pushing out other species in the biome and it's running yeah you know physical traps can only do so much and the other alternative that we've used in the past is poisoning which then hits anything in that environment it mm -hmm. goes all the way up and down the food chains so you know yeah maybe that's a solution right the only problem with the gene drive is there's not a, if you start poisoning and you're like, oh, it looks like this poison actually affects more creatures than we thought, you can stop. You, right. Mm -hmm. yep. Stop deploying it, right? The problem with the yep. gene drive is that once it's out there, it's out there. That's just it. Well, but this is where the beauty of the island comes into play. So just take a few <laughs> of each of the local rodents, right, that are, that are endemic that you want to save. Make sure you have a stable genetic population in, in captivity. Then release the gene drive. Then if it totally messes everything up and all of the rodent populations collapse, you just give it a few years and then reintroduce the, uh, the species that you had in captivity again. Because it's about an island, so it's contained, right? You know. Never mind population bottlenecks and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but, you yeah. know. So, yeah. I mean, you can only do so much. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd have more confidence, too, if Australia had a good history of dealing with invasive species. Right. Yes, yeah, we're we're not introducing them on its own. Going on yeah. Over there. Like, yeah, fix the – before you move on to the house mouse, fix the, the, the cane toad, toad problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't start creating new – Oh, my God. You know, Speaking of cane toad, there was an amazing story this week that I did not bring to the show that I just want everyone to Google later, which is about how cane toads eat. And maybe, you know what? I'll bring it next week for uh, um, for Thanksgiving, for Twistgiving. I'll bring it next oh week. Oh, my. Okay. So okay. stay tuned. I'm going to talk about cane toads swallowing next oh, week. Oh, yeah. I'm not ready for that tonight. Okay. Speaking of swallowing, uh, you had a story, <laughs> Justin, about – we gotta we gotta swallow something about longevity and going. leprosy. Yeah, right. what? <laughs> Smooth transition, kid. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Important yeah. is to live longer lives, 
Not all humans prioritize this. This fashionable idea. Healthy aging requires health to keen interest in keeping organs healthy beyond their factory warranty dates. There's exercise and diet options for sustaining organ health to a point. But at some point, one or more organs will fail. And since you typically need all of your organs functioning all of the time, this failure of organ function often results in death. But what if we could rejuvenate our existing organs? Turn back the clock on years of perhaps willful neglect or just science our way out of the normal aging process. Hope may have arrived. Yes, researchers have unlocked longer lives through the liver and leprosy and nine banded armadillos. Oh, yes. One of the only animals that still get leprosy. Yes. Yeah. And an interesting question because uh, maybe they got it from us to begin with. I think that's still a, an open question. That the only animal that, uh, other than humans, that contracts, le contracts leprosy might have gotten it from us hundreds of years ago. Anyway, it causes uh, leprosy, uh, if you're not familiar, is an infection of the bacteria Mycobacterium leprae. It causes extensive nerve and muscle damage throughout the body, leaving victims with severe disfigurement and resulting disability. Major scary disease for much of human history. Now treatable with antibiotics. Thank you, science. So, this is a really, this is a really strange story, though. The nine-banded armadillos that, uh, yes, can uh, very, very often can be the host. I think there's some, the number I saw was something like 20% of armadillo population has leprosy. It's just, it's a happy place. It likes to, likes to live on an armadillo. In infected armadillos, the leprosy bacteria was found to reprogram the entire liver and significantly increased total liver size. They also discovered several indicators that the main kinds of liver cells, hepatocytes, had reached a rejuvenated state in infected animals. So this isn't just like liver, liver enlargement or liver swelling or inflammation, anything like that. Genes related to metabolism, growth, and cell proliferation were activated and those linked with aging were down-regulated or even suppressed. Scientists think this is because the leprosy bacteria reprogrammed the liver cells, returning them, dialing them back to the earlier stage of progenitor cells, which in turn became new hepatocytes and grew new liver tissues. Findings have been published in the journal Cell Reports Medicine, and it suggests the possibility of adapting the natural process to renew aging livers and increase healthy healthy liver lifespans in humans. It also may be used as a way to regrow damaged livers, thereby reducing the need for transplantation, which is currently the only option for people who are having sort of end-stage scarred liver disease type problems. Liver disease currently kills 2 million people in the world, so this could be very significant. Also, what they found is that, that there's, there was no uh, increase in like tumor activity or anything like that. So this is not just like a runaway growth issue. It really sort of dialed it back to what they compared to a human liver in, in vitro, just like of, of a developing liver. Well, that's fascinating. Dial it back, start it over. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. So I should go cuddle with at least five armadillos. No. Yes, because that by will... just getting leprosy 20%, alone. Yes. Yep, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not seeing this message. <laughs> well, we're going to, no, no, they're going to package up. You'll get like a little lollipop in the mail covered in right. uh, leprosy. And then you, just, right. you lick that and you'll be fine. No. <laughs> Okay, so they're going to learn what all of the molecular signals are and how the leprosy is leading to 
this proliferative state to the. Oh, regrowth. that's another way to do it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. I think that something at some point it will involve leeches. No. Nope. Because that's always been. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about that. This seems very. <laughs> I'm going to go to the barber type of. Stuff. Why does it have to have leeches? It needs <laughs> leprosy leeches. I don't know because leprosy. I mean, so actually, this is the crazy thing. Is like uh, leprosy still is a is a thing in the world? Yeah. It, it, we think of it as an ancient disease. We think of it as something that has been eradicated. It hasn't. Uh-uh. It's just that it's there. It's treatable with antibiotics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So so it's not one of those diseases where, like the you know there was there was colonies like if people got the disease they would send them to go live off in the leprosy village, mm-hmm. uh, which with all the with other lepers too. That yeah. was the whole thing. You know, uh, it's a really awful treatment of humans uh, resulted from this. But kind of maybe universe. some understanding of germ theory, which is interesting. I don't know if it really. Yeah, maybe, but or just like. Mm, you know, it's the, the you got the vapors. You yeah, got the exactly. bad vapors. Well, they know there's like contagion, right? It's pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. No. So armadillos with leprosy mm-hmm. yeah. are going to help us save our livers. Yeah. And did you and, know that nine banded armadillos no always give birth to identical quadruplets? I did not, but now I there do. You go. Wow. Trivia. They have That's leprosy exciting. too. <laughs> <laughs> Identical uh, leprous armadillo <laughs> quadruplets. Yeah. All right. Oh joy. All right, Blair. Mm. What do you have for us? Oh, ho, ho. I have good news about mosquitoes. Good news. All right. Yes. Yeah. So this is from Nagoya University. This is a new way potentially to control mosquito populations. More passive method i would say than a gene drive or poisoning them with pesticides that maybe we'll get to other animals in the environment i like it it's very specific to mosquitoes and has i would think less of a, a concern about getting out to neighboring populations so um the researchers kind of discovered, they were like, you know, those mosquitoes are always buzzing around. That buzzing is really annoying. Well, it, seemed, it turns out that this sound that the females are making when they fly around, where they're seeking sources of blood, male mosquitoes actually listen to that for this very specific high-pitched noise to find females. Male mosquito ears are shaped like antennas and they vibrate at the same frequency as female mosquito wings. So their wings are making this buzzing sound and the the male mosquitoes are listening to that sound going, oh, that sounds like a female mosquito. And so when a female flies by, the male ears detect this frequency, resonate, they send a signal to their brain, they go, go get her. (laughs) Beep, boop, 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 beep, boop, 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 boop. Tune in, tune in. Yeah. And so this study was looking at what if, we made it so the males couldn't hear the females buzzing. So they wanted to see if they could make the male mosquito ears go out of tune so that they were totally oblivious to the presence of females. So in this version of mosquito control, the idea is you just stop future mosquitoes from ever being born because mom and dad mosquito would never meet. And so what they did is they identified the involvement of a major neurotransmitter, um, serotonin, (laughs) in the auditory system of the insect. And so then they manipulated serotonin levels. They used laser Doppler vibrometry, which involves using a laser as a highly sensitive measurement tool to detect changes in nanoscale vibrations of mosquito ears. And so they used that to measure the vibrations after serotonin-related changes so they they changed the exposure to serotonin um and saw how those vibrations kind of differed and they discovered that after they fed the mosquitoes a serotonin inhibiting compound their vibration frequency decreased and they couldn't hear the ladies anymore so the next step is to yeah. figure out exactly which receptors are responsible for tuning the ears of the mosquitoes so that they can target that exact receptor 
so that they can be way more specific about how this is going to work, right? Because you can't just spray serotonin everywhere. You're like, that'll fix the mosquitoes. <laughs> so there's still a lot to be done here, but I love this idea yeah. of a more of a more passive population control of just like, what if we just make them just have misconnections over and over? Just, oh man, just never worked out. Joseph <laughs> said her in the uh, chat room, why not use speakers to produce the same sound the female wings make oh. to lure the males into traps? Ooh, I was thinking that too. Ooh, mosquito well, zappers with the buzzing. But I think it would drive us crazy, potentially. I don't know. So so it would it would drive us crazy up until an age of or somewhere in the mid-20s. You can't hear mosquitoes anymore? I can no, see them. No, they're my, gone. They're my, gone. My really? hearing is pretty bad, but I can oh. still hear mosquitoes. So that was that's the whole idea between uh, behind this, uh, what was actually called the mosquito... Uh, which was a device that uh, British shop owners would put out front of their stores that would make a high frequency pitch sound that only teenagers could hear. You lose, you, you don't realize it. It's not that your hearing is all bad, but the high, uh, high range frequency is probably long gone, Blair. You just haven't noticed it. No, I know because, that, but it's not, yeah. I still hear mosquitoes. Oh, well. Yeah, but you, <laughs> so yeah, so maybe it's a thing that teenagers would hear. Maybe it's a thing we'd all hear. But yeah, I think that's a fun. I think that is a fun uh, Gillisader, uh suggestion. Then but Arlen is asking, uh, why can't we just spray serotonin everywhere? That would mess us up. I think <laughs> right? ultimately, ultimately, yeah, we don't need that everywhere, right? Yeah, I was kind of like, there's nothing scarier than a mosquito lab. <laughs> this, all you know those what will really those... get you are those pictures of people sticking their entire arm into a mosquito box to see how many times they get bit. No, thank yeah. you. No. Nope, I'll pass on that. Yeah. Oh my goodness. All right, so serotonin inhibitors for mosquitoes so yes. that they, mom and dad can't make babies. Right. Yeah. It seems, seems easy enough. Let's just let's just make I that mean, happen. Easier than some of the other things we've talked about to control mosquito populations. So, is it as easy as launching a mission to the moon? Yes. No. I don't know. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> well, we got to you know we literally yeah. got to the moon last time based on Newtonian physics, which is like hundreds and hundreds of years old and wasn't even completely right. Like about how space and time work, so yeah, yeah. You, you can do it with with, um, with a good calculation and a partial knowledge of physics. Sure, it's not a problem. No problem. Well, NASA has not had a problem this time. So yet again, first time since 1972. We have launched a mission in the direction of the moon today at about 1.30 ish in the morning, Eastern time. We saw the launch of the Artemis One mission that has taken off. We, the, the Orion shuttle has separated from the rockets and has, uh, has jettisoned its own rocket boosters and is on its way with its mannequin crew to the moon. It's going to go around the moon. It's going to come back. And this is, oh, hey, look at that. Advertisements. I love that. Um, and it's going to give us proof that we can send people. Once again, can we send Wait. humankind back to the moon? It's going to send us. Well, it'll come Poof. back, and if it comes, well, it'll come back, and if it comes back in one piece, and the mannequins and everything is everything good, that it's like we can do it again. Let's do it, and let's put you know, people. Yeah, every in time it. NASA's do doing this kind of stuff, it makes me really question whether or not we got there the first time. <laughs> like, what was like? We're going to see if we can prove a uh, concept of putting a man on the moon. It's like, wait, and we did why? Before. But yeah, the, what they yes. when they did it before, if we did it with a much more primitive technology, Actually, this time we have advanced technology. Nope, which 
might need to update in the middle of the mission and therefore just, you know, things. So you have all these new. Well, but this is the thing. Um, There's, yes, some, you know, modern technology, wiring, other things. But when it comes to the rockets, like we're still just using a big old rocket to get it off the planet. And it's. It, it's not that much advanced from what we were using before. So the question the is... The neurobiologist saying rocket science is just rocket science. It's just, right. It's just it's rocket, rocket science. science. That's right. <laughs> yes, well, uh, this, this SLS rocket, the Artemis mission was made up of the SLS rocket, which was 322 feet tall, and it emitted 9 million pounds of thrust, 4.1 million kilograms, for those of you who like the metric system, to get away from our planet, to, to flee Florida. Um, the Orion spacecraft broke away with its moonikins. Yes, thank you, Goldazader. I saw that comment in the chat room. And uh, about two hours after liftoff, the Orion free flew and has been headed away from our planet. There have been some great pictures from the Orion shuttle uh, heading toward the moon with uh, the Earth in the background. It's well on its way. And, yeah. you know, I was, I was skeptical that this would happen this year, so it's very exciting that they have made this happen. And the SLS mission, the Artemis One mission, is on its way. It does bode well for a return to the moon so this is good congratulations on the billions and billions of dollars spent on the single use giant rocket that put the capsule that's the very tiny into space and um, let's spend billions and millions more dollars to put another rocket underneath that giant capsule but with people in it let's do it but i don't know why to send people I think we do such a great job robots in in space now. They they definitely can stay there longer. They can get therefore a lot more work done. Mm -hmm. Rovers are going. That's a plan. Rovers are going for sure. Yeah, I I still don't understand the whole you know uh, putting a a a hairless ape in the top of a firecracker and launching it out, out there being such a big deal. When you can put robots on another planet, planetoid, moon, whatever, and and explore for months and months and years and years, you send one of those apes up there. You got to bring them back right away. You got yeah. Oh, they need their oxygen well, and their food and all this stuff. Well, the whole you know, time. we haven't melded with the machines yet, so you know if we have any, you know, haven't we? No, not completely. We're not we're we're not half AI yet. So you know, if we do want to leave the planet, like and really explore the universe, at this point in time, it's you know, people. We gotta go. We gotta go. People know. gotta go. We gotta go. You gotta say go. you say we haven't melded yet. I, I've been on mass transit. I've been out in public. <laughs> I've I've seen uh, every human to connected them. to an electronic device. I don't, yeah. I don't really know what more connected they can be the fact that it plugs into them to recharge like won't make that much of a difference at that point yeah oh people are we going to spread our dna through the universe it's a big question human base a moon base from which we can explore the rest of the solar system Oh, it's Those, coming. It's coming, but the first steps are getting back to the moon. And so this is that direction. Congratulations, NASA. Um, but instead of looking to the future, Justin, tell me what we have learned from the past. There is an archaeological site in Israel. Blue, 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 blue. A year old fish. What? Whoa. Freshwater. Now, was that was that blurred a little, little, little sound because uh, uh, there was a, a hiccup in the feed here? Or was that your reaction to? Yeah, you're you're clipping and uh, <laughs> lagging and water and pausing a bunch. Oh, uh oh. Okay. Well, then uh, I will hold off on this straight and go ahead and move on. Uh, I'll do it later. No. Yeah, All right. Kiki's shaking her head now. Okay. 
Oh, everyone in the chat oh, room is saying again? you're breaking up in the extreme. So okay, I'll go away. I'll come back. Let's see if it'll improve because it seems to do fine when I right when I get here, and then now it's getting worse. Okay. People are waking up. I don't know what's going on. But instead of thinking of the past, let's think of the future. Let's really let's let's continue thinking of the future. This Week in Science is still with you. Thank you for joining us for another episode. We do appreciate that you are here once again. And if you are enjoying the show, please do share it with a friend. Additionally, if you are uh, thinking that you want to see twists keep going into the future, then we would appreciate your support as a patron. And if you would love to join us on Patreon, head over to twist.org, click the Patreon link and choose your level of support. Join our supporting community as a patron, $10 and more per month, and we will thank you by name at the end of the show. We really appreciate your support and cannot do what we do without you. Really can't. It's nothing without you. But now we're going to come on back, and it is that time of the show that we get to talk about animals. It's that wonderful time of the show called Blair's Animal Corner with Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a What you got, Blair? <gasps> I'm so glad you asked. I have two stories that I just am so excited to talk to you about today. This first one blew my mind. It is a very simple story, but its implications are enormous. So this is a study, a team of researchers from Leibniz Institute of Freshwater Ecology and Inland Fisheries and the Cluster of Excellent Science of Intelligence at the Humboldt University Zoo Berlin has shown that besides nature and nurture, We've always thought that the personality of us, of other individual animals, is either defined by your genetics, nature, or the environment around you as you grow up and experience the world, nurture, that can somehow condition you to act in a certain way. So you are, you are kind of the result of the, the recipe and the... Uh, Conditions in the kitchen, I guess, are both things that can impact your your final <laughs> your final product, right? But what if you have a clonal pair of fish, so genetically identical individuals, and they are raised in an identical environment, and on the first day of their life, they already are showing character differences. What does that mean? I don't know, Blair. What does it mean? G genes? I don't know. <laughs> it's, they have the same genes, so it can't be the genes. Their genes are exactly the same. Mm, imprinting, RNA, other things. Right. Could be RNA. Could be right. epigenetics. Could be something to do with things that happen pre-birth inside the mother. There could be environmental differences. Or... There could be something else that impacts who you are, whether you're a fish or a human or anything in between or beyond. There could be something else that impacts your behavior besides your genetics and, the, and the, your environment. Which at first sounds crazy. Then if you think about it a little longer, why not? Why not? Why? <laughs> who's to say that... Your microbiome could be slightly different from one individual to another. It could be seeded differently. It could have different interactions inside you to have different uh, dominant strains of bacteria in your body. Who's to say you don't have electrical signals that travel differently by mere chance inside your brain or your lump of neurons mm -hmm. in any set? Like every second is a variable. Right. Right. And so yes. there we go. Yeah, sure. 
you have the same genes and you have the same environment, but chemical reactions and every possible flip of a coin could be different from the second your cells start to divide. So I love this story because, you know, I could talk a whole lot more about the scientific method here and, you know, that they, they had these, uh, Amazon mollies, Pocilia formosa. They, they are a type of fish that naturally reproduce clonally. So the offspring are genetic copies of their mother. So all three of them are genetically identical. There's also no brood care. So as soon as they're born, mom is gone. She pieces out. There's nothing that she's doing that could impact the fish. And they recorded their behavior over 10 weeks, the first 10 weeks of their lives. And on day one, there were behavioral differences and individualities on these individual fish. And so all of that aside, I just love this idea that there is an option three beyond nature or nurture. There is something else happening. And I feel like it's like entropy or like lady luck. Mm. It's just like random stuff. It's just the randomness of the universe. Yeah. I mean, I love your comment that every second is a variable where I hadn't really considered that before, but for sure, if two organisms are identical in every single way, genes, the way their neurons are set up, everything, they're identical twins, right? Except that something hits, light hits the neurons of the eye of one individual at a different time than the other individual, or maybe different a different type of light or, you know, the experiences Mm -hmm. start to be slightly different. And when you're talking about those minute differences, you know, if you've ever seen um, the movie Sliding Doors, where it was like an old Gwyneth Gwyneth Paltrow movie where, you know, you can make the choice to step out the doors or you don't, you know, kind of like that multiple realities, multiple parallel universes kind of uh, existence. This this kind of fits that, but in a biological uh-huh. eco like a biological reality. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I, I mean, of course, then I get kind of really trippy thinking about how like life itself on Earth is part of the product of chance and the primordial mm-hmm. soup and that everything happened in a specific way to make a specific chain reaction happen that created life. And here we all are. Not to say there wouldn't be life other wise, but it might be different yeah. if things had happened differently by mere chance, right? And so, yeah, it's just, I feel like disorganization is the organization of the universe (laughs) and (laughs) chance is the plan, I guess. And so I just, that's, I just, I went way off on this journey in my brain about how we don't think about that enough when we're trying to create models in hypothetical science. Right. And so we say that this is how Punnett square works and this is how your genes work. And this is how, Um, stress in childhood works and impacts who you are as an adult and all these sorts of things that are very clear cause and effect. But there's so much that happens to you that is difficult to quantify and manipulate in a test scenario that I wouldn't even call it nurture as part of this conversation. It's just kind of chemistry. (laughs) Just like the way the natural world works towards entropy and disorganization is organization. I don't, I don't know. I'm going way off topic and um, I don't know. <laughs> I just, I think that, that this is a simultaneously like eye opening and earth shattering thing for me to read. And also something that is like, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I find it I find yeah. it uh, fascinating also that like the the repeatability the variance seems to increase everything changes over the course of this experiment and uh, the just the data itself is, is so fascinating like yeah definitely worth a deep dive into questioning how it all works is it all just chance yeah 
Nature how nurture. How are they so different from the moment they're born? Yeah. Nature nurture and other stuff. <laughs> other stuff. Other stuff. Miscellaneous yeah. potpourri. Anyway. Uh. Uh. Okay. So, that was kind of my earth-shattering discovery. Now a less earth-shattering discovery. Homosexuality exists in nature. What? Right. <laughs> yeah, yes. we know. We know about this. This is no surprise. But what I think there's still a lot of research being done on is why. Because there are animals that have sex for pleasure. But there are also lots of animals that, to our knowledge, do not. And therefore, if sex is only to create offspring, why would homosexuality exist in those species? And we know it exists. So there's something happening here that uh, is worth looking at. For a bunch of reasons. Just because, like, again, challenging those previously expected kind of fundamental ideas of how biology works is really important to understanding the world and science in general, but also it's important to challenge certain expectations that certain individuals have about humans because we are animals based on looking at other species as well. So all that to say, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in collaboration with University of St. Andrews studied the Japanese termite reticulitermes spiritus okay and found that their ability um to form same-sex pairings and also switch sex roles during courtship can be traced back to distant termite ancestors so termites have very specific sex roles in courtship they occur during a very brief and frantic period of time once a year. So during kind of the mating season for termites, thousands of these winged termites disperse from their nests. They swarm into the air. And before they land on the ground and um, shed their wings, they start to try to rush and find a partner. And so once they find a partner, now wingless, the two termites will set off to find a nest to start a new colony. They move together in a very specific courtship behavior called a tandem run. It is coordinated. Each sex has a specific role in this tandem run. The female termite leads and the male termite follows behind. It's, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you want to kind of anthropomorphize it. It's like she's picking out a spot and he's like watching her back. He's protecting her. Right? So protecting if they get separated. Yes, exactly. You got it. And if they get separated, the female will pause while the male searches for her. She just waits. She's like, he wandered off again. He'll find me. So they have a very specific role that they do not deviate from when they are in a heterosexual pairing. If a male termite is unable to find a female, or if a female is unable to find a male before kind of all of the pairings are used up and they're left all alone, they will choose, in many cases, to form male-male and female-female pairings and establish a same-sex nest together rather than staying single. If this was just for creating babies, there would be no reason to do this. However, they there's a couple things happening. So one is that they think that um, staying outside longer at a certain point, you kind of just got to pair off and pick a, pick a spot because staying outside longer, you'll get eaten. So you want to reduce your, your chance of getting predated upon. But also having a partner in their uh, their burrow is very important because they groom each other to remove pathogens, which keeps right. them healthy while they're they're wintering in their little in their little uh, home. So um, also in many cases, females can reproduce via parthenogenesis if they don't find a male. So even if they are in a female female pairing, they can still raise babies together. Males will pair off, have their, their, their male roommate, as it were. And then they will sometimes sneak off and try to mate with a female and then come back. <laughs> and so they're still trying to get their, uh, their mating taken care of, their, their proliferation taken care of. But having a partner there is still important. 
Yeah. And so um, yeah. what this we so this has been known for a while that there are female female parent pairings and male male pairings in termites. What makes this study important is that if they were just saying, oh, anybody will do, then they would, then they wouldn't take on specific roles. They would just kind of be like, all right, buddy, get in here with me. <laughs> Let's be roommates. But instead, um, when they are faring the, they're forming these male, male um, tandems or female, female tandems, one of them takes a role of the female and one of them takes a role of the male. When female, female termites are separated, the follower female will search for the other termite, just like males do, who are normally in the back. And when uh, in male males, the same thing happens. If the front male gets separated, he pauses, he waits for the follower male to find him. So they have very specific roles and they adhere to those based on kind of how they pick up in the pairing. So this shows very, very complicated dynamics because they're setting up a clear mating ritual right. with a same sex pairing. It's not, like I said, it's not just two termites hanging out together in a burrow. They have set up this very specific courtship behavior to then kind of bond and join in this space. So this also is something that they think has gone way, way back in the, in the fossil record um, because they actually think based on previous studies that males and females were able to both lead and follow in a, in a very way, way back ancestor. So actually they think that over time they have specialized into one role and now they are, they are able to switch back because they have this kind of evolutionary history of having sometimes been a follower and sometimes been a leader in the past. And so, you know, the gender roles were maybe even less important before in, uh, in, in previous ancestors. Um, and so it's just a very interesting kind of look at same-sex pairings in an invertebrate in a species that uh, social behavior is a little bit harder to see than in perhaps primates or even just yeah. most mammals in general. Um, and also that it has a very clear purpose and evolutionary advantage and therefore persists through evolutionary history. Right. Yeah, I think that what's really clear here is that the evolutionary advantage is... It's, uh, it's preservation of individuals. And so as a whole, it's preservation of the population for, you know, whether you said health reasons or mm -hmm. just protection or whatever. And then also those instinctual aspects of how reproduction happens, but it's mm -hmm. evolutionarily, it's conserving aspects of, aspects of their biology and yeah. maintaining the population and the variety. And if you think about it, variation is important to populations. You need all sorts of variety to make sure that populations are able to easily adapt to any kind of situations moving forward. Yeah. And I yeah. think, you know, if, if you can extrapolate, which, you know, I don't have data on this right here, but let's yeah. say if we know that these invertebrates show same sex pairing and we know that many iterations of invertebrates over hundreds of thousands of years show same-sex pairing. And we know that we have a common ancestor with invertebrates hundreds of million years ago. <laughs> There's a good chance that homosexuality in nature is hundreds of millions of years old. And I think that, um, it, it is a good time to just pause and recognize that and recognize that it is a normal part of nature and actually is conserved evolutionarily because it has advantages. Yes. It's, yep. Yeah. I just think it's a very cool study to kind of explore that, that pocket I mean, I think, of biology. I think, it, I think it is. And it's a good reminder that, you know, when you look at biology, there are so many strategies there are multiple strategies for all sorts of things. And, you know, we just 
the humans, we think we've got, you know, one, but we, we don't, mm. but there, there's variety even yeah. within humans and it's not, it, it's nothing new. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's exactly. yeah, and it's certainly there's not a point in human history where it hasn't been recorded. Right. Right. So, exactly. I mean, like, it's nonsense to even argue otherwise. Yeah. So, biology. Yeah. Biology is biology is biology. And yeah, we're all part of it. Yeah. Interesting. Birds study. do Thank it, you. bees do it, even fleas do it, right? That's what we're learning here. <laughs> We all do it. Everybody does it at some point. <laughs> this is This Week in Science. And Justin, you're back. Tell us about some I old am. things. I am. You, you got things to say? Go back to the old fish. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, so there's an archaeological site in Israel, which has turned up a 780,000-year-old fish, a freshwater carp, and it was gigantic. Two meters or six and a half feet in length. Uh, and I actually found quite a few remains from this ancient fish. Teeth of this giant carp and other fish were found in large quantities at different layered depths of the site, showing that many of the fish had come to rest in the same location over the years, just next to the location of an ancient lake. By studying the structure of crystals that formed in the enamels of the teeth, Researchers were able to discover that the fish were exposed to sustained heat in the range of cooking temperatures, though not intense enough to have been placed directly in a fire. Professor Gorin Inbar states, The fact that cooking of fish is evident over such a long and unbroken period of settlement at the site indicates a continuous tradition of cooking food. This is another in a series of discoveries relating to the high cognitive capabilities of the Acheulean hunter-gatherers who were active in the ancient Hula Valley region. These groups were deeply familiar with the environment and the very sources it offered them. It is even possible that they were cooking not just fish, but also various types of animals and plants. The fact that they're calling them Acheulean hunter-gatherers suggests that they have tool examples. Uh, the Acheulean culture goes back one and a half million years of stone axe making technology predominantly uh, they're used by homo erectus homo egaster even neanderthals uh, in the earlier stages were using the same million and a half year technology which to me has always been a good argument for human ancestors having language because this is a preserved technology for me, we, we don't have a language that's, that's 10,000 years old that's been preserved. And here's, here's a technology that has that managed to persist for a million and a half, million and a half years. It's crazy. So, Fish but we don't really, good. But we don't know who these, uh, these Achillean hunter-gatherers are. They don't apparently have human remain artifacts. So you can pick your early hominin to guess who was there. The, the, the age of the site at 780,000 year range is pre-Neanderthal, likely Homo heidelbergensis, the predecessor of both human and Neanderthal. And these, these, these uh, fellows were all over Europe, Africa, Asia, along with their technology. They brought it with them. Esca excavations at the site uncovered flint, basalt, and limestone tools as well as a rich diversity of plant species, including fruit, nuts, and seeds, and many species of land mammals, both medium and large in size. They say here the transition from raw food to cooked food had dramatic implications on human development behavior. Eating cooked food reduces the body's energy required to break down and digest food. That gives you, I suppose, some amount of leisure time or brain development energy left over. Over time, it also leads to structural changes in the jaw and the skull. You don't have to chew so hard, I guess. You tear with your teeth. Uh, some scientists view eating fish as a milestone in the quantum leap in human cognitive evolution, providing a central catalyst for the development of the human brain. Thinking is that eating fish uh, with its uh, omega-3 fatty acids, zinc iodine more, contributed to brain development. It goes back, though, early man, they say here, uh, began to eat raw fish 
around 2 million years ago, but until this study, the earliest evidence of cooking was around 170,000 years ago. So finding, finding this is, gosh, what is that, 600,000 years? Yeah, that adds, that adds 600,000 years to it. Yeah, wow. Wow, that really was right. Studies published in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution. Uh, very interesting. And then another ancient uh, human story from Scientific Reports. Researchers from the University of Seville have applied optically stimulated luminescence technique from on some uh, human footprints found in the southern found in southern Spain back in 2020. It's quite a, a nice collection of footprints. There's uh, 300 in all, around 30 of them that they would they considering well preserved. So where you can really take measurements, maybe get some some gait and stride information out of them. Footprints had been initially dated to around 100,000 years ago, and then therefore assumed to be Neanderthal. But this new dating technique found it was much older. They were set down 295,000 years. Wow. Which, yeah, which, so they could still be Neanderthal. Early stage Neanderthal, proto pre Neanderthal, something between the Heidelbergensis uh, that was doing the cooking 780,000 years ago and Neanderthals, maybe heading off in that direction. Time period is also sort of interesting. Uh, the sea level would have been about 60 meters below its current level as the planet was having, was, it was, it was, it, the planet was warming, but it was leaving a major glacial. Uh, glaciation event so tons of ice and uh, at the poles and big glaciers covering the earth so the sea level 60 meters which is 180 100 200 ish feet and so the the area where they found these footprints would have been prone to melt off it was a big coastal plain uh, which is how all of these footprints were captured the planet has been through some extremes before. There has been global warming, global cooling. And that brings us to Just Good News, the segment of the show where we stick our hand down the stuck drain pipe of science news subjects in hopes of removing that little bit of good news that has been lodged in there for weeks. Global warming edition. Earth's climate, we know, has been around for a really long time. In the early days, it was intense volcanism. Volcanoes going off and hot lava spewing everywhere. Then there's been planet-wide ice ages and warming events. There's been no oxygen, high oxygen, swings in carbon, solar radiation. And through the past 3.7 billion years, life has continued to exist. Global warming is currently threatening the Earth's habitable climate. But now, a study by MIT researchers published in Science Advances, again, has found that our planet can self-regulate its climate through a built-in stabilizing feedback mechanism that naturally pulls the climate back from the brink, keeping global temperatures within a steady, habitable range. The Earth does this, they think, or have thought in the past through silicate weathering. This is a geological process in which uh, weathering of silicate rocks involves chemical reactions that ultimately draw carbon dioxide out of the uh, atmosphere into sediments in the ocean, trapping the gas in the rocks. And so they, they went and they sort of drilled down on this idea. New findings are based on the study of paleoclimate data that record changes in average global temperatures over the past 66 million years. The MIT team applied a mathematical analysis to see whether the data revealed any characteristic of these stabilizing phenomena that reigned in global temperatures. And they found that indeed there appears to be consistent patterns in which the Earth's temperature swings are dampened. Sort of like putting brakes on a car as it's slowly coming to a stop and getting going and preventing most extreme of extreme weather events or climate shifts from occurring. According to Konstantin Arnsheet, graduate student, MIT's Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences, on the one hand, it's good because we know that today's global warming will eventually be canceled out through this stabilizing feedback. 
So there we have it. Just good news. No need to worry about global warming anymore. There was another hand. What's the other hand? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. We can keep going. But on the other hand, ah, see, here Bring it, it through. Catch it. On the other hand, it will take hundreds of thousands of years for this to happen. Yeah, figures. So not fast enough to solve our present day issues. Dang it. Anyway, the result of the first day actually. The Earth issues. Unless Just we can force ours. the issue, right? Yeah, let's force those stabilizing factors to come through. Or I just so upload there myself is... into the singularity and just wait it out. Yep. I still don't know what an upload. Are you talking about joining the metaverse? Like, what is that even that no. singular? It's nonsense. So, so you're right, though. Uh, there is something different about this time around in, in, in climate change is that it is being caused by humans. And there's humans on this planet who through science and a lot of good information that, that we've collected over the years, good knowledge, could do something about it. That's right. And we will. We we'll will. science our we way are. out of this, folks. We'll, we'll do science it. it. We will do science to it. I have some stories to end the show. Let's be brainy. Yes. You want to be brainy? Always. Always, we love brains. Let's talk about brains, everybody. So I love the hippocampus. The hippocampus is one of my favorite areas of the brain because it's related to spatial location finding. And it's also related to memory, getting our memories all settled in our brains. And we kind of think of it as the bus station or the train station that information comes into and then gets shuttled out to various areas of the brain for, you know, connect. Oh, no. No, actually, uh, this, is, this is actually part of her presentation. She's explaining that the brain operates a lot like Wi-Fi, where there's a, a central router for all of the information channeling through our brains at any given time and that we're sort of <laughs> and then in certain diseases imaging it's like the uh the router <laughs> fails Wait, no. we'll get there yeah we, like... we, we lost you for the whole time yeah oh, no uh, yeah. because we heard about the like train the... station and then you froze <laughs> because my internet is uh, my router <laughs> <laughs> anyway, technology. Let's hope that I can get through the end of the show, everybody. Yes. Let's let's hold let's hold those hopes close. Uh, so anyway, the hippocampus is uh, it's similar to a bus station or a train station where information comes in and then gets connected to different networks throughout the brain, hopefully to create memories that are long lasting. Um, However, these researchers looking at it out of the University of Sydney have used a new technique that's relatively new called the called diffusion weighted imaging and it's similar to MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging. However, it uses uses the diffusion of water molecules through tissues to create the contrast that is needed for the images that they Use. So how much water is being diffused is a measure of kind of how active things are. And so that creates uh, a measure of, of the strength of signal and how, how active an area of the brain is. So they created this high resolution map of the connections, like the little nerve connections within the brain between the hippocampus and the cerebral cortex from seven adult females around your age, Blair. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, just about your age-ish. Um, and so what they discovered is that these white matter pathways, these connections between the hippocampus and the cortex are much more highly linked to the visual areas of the cortex than our primate relatives. So similar measurements of our primate relatives have found that there's more connections all over the place. But human hippocampuses, or at least the hippocampi of these seven adult females, are much more visually connected. And so the question is, is this something that's very specific to how humans learn and remember things? 
or is it something that just happened to be biased toward these particular images, uh, these particular individuals? But it's uh, an interesting question because we they expected that there would be more connections to the frontal areas of the brain where we have planning and our you know a lot of our what we consider our active cognitive areas as opposed to just the construction of mental images in our mind's eye and the visual images. Um, so the question is, did humans develop a different pattern of connectivity? More study is needed hmm. because I don't think we can base anything on seven adult females. No. But anyway, it's a puzzle. It's very interesting. And the study is published in eLife as of this last week. So. We will determine someday. I mean, we know we're visual. We have a giant visual cortex compared to other primates. Huge. Our visual cortex is just, just wonderful. But anyway. Well, is this uh, something that, that could, be, could be kind of trained over your lifetime? Like if you looked at the hippocampus of a toddler, would it be different? And that's a great question. We're looking at adult, seven adult females. Yeah. I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> so there are a lot of, there are a lot of questions that are still uh, definitely to be determined. Like, is this something that's developmental? Is this something that can be altered based on experience? Is this something that's specifically genetic and it just happened that this sample of females fell mm. within that? Is this indicative of all humans? Big question. Is it that third thing that we talked about before? <laughs> Chaos, uh. entropy, chance. Yep. Yes. Uh, well, some other researchers, I'm going to move on to a different study out of the Allen Institute. They just uh, presented their research at the, uh, the annual Society of Neuroscience, Society for Neuroscience meeting in San Diego. Their study... They took chunks of brain that had been removed from uh, from people with from from individuals who had uh, issues with their brains. So the these areas of the brain, instead of getting thrown out, were used for science. The researchers at the Allen Institute took these little pieces of discarded waste from individuals, uh, these, these areas of the brain were responsible for seizures in, in individuals. So instead of getting thrown out, they used it and um, they exposed them, these little chunks of brain, to psilocybin. See what would happen. Now, understanding what we think we've understood about the way that psilocybin affects neurons in the brain, they expected that there would be a huge activation of serotonin receptors because they know that psilocybin mimics serotonin, a particular, uh, and, and, and connects to different psilocybin, uh, serotonin receptors in the brain. And so they said, yes, it's going to activate the serotonin receptors. But what actually they determined is that some of the cells were activated. Some of them were not activated, and most neurons did not respond at all. What? Yeah. So What's now the question is, on? you have a molecule, psilocybin, that mimics serotonin. What's happening with these cells? How are the cells unique? Some activated, some not, some not responding. Why do different cells, do different cells, we know different cells have different serotonin receptors. There are a number of different serotonin receptors, so maybe there is a much higher specificity than what we once determined. Maybe there are cofactors that are required for activation mm -hmm. that we're not aware of. Um, when you take psilocybin out of the mushroom, what does that do? So the you know we we've been experimenting mm -hmm. a lot on marijuana and CBD and some of and the components of uh, the cannabinoid family and but, science has too yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> but the same has yet to be done with psilocybin and why would there not necessarily be different 
forms of psilocybin, Mm -hmm. different Mm -hmm. cofactors that might be in there, different receptors that are activated differently that we don't really know how that works. So there is a broadening of uh, of research that's going to be uh, going to be based on these findings, but uh, they don't really know specifically how psilocybin leads to the hallucinatory Mm -hmm. and the psychological effects that we have seen and the potential for therapeutic uses kind of hinges on Mm -hmm. understanding that. Yeah, because you need to be able to control dosage and all these sorts of things if you're going to use it medicinally, of course. Oh, well, yeah, to an extent. You have to have an idea. Which it's harder to understand how dosage of a mushroom works if you don't know what. I mean, part is it a it big measure mushroom? or what the is activation it a little is? Mushroom? Exactly. Uh, is, 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 is it, it by weight? <laughs> yeah, do it by weight. And is it how is it how is moisture part of it? Like is moisture activating <sighs> in the in the process in some way? And so if it's a well, dry, yeah, it's how they they're gonna grow in a in a moist. It's, and if I, yeah, but so, like, but, is it the dried mushroom more potent? You don't know. Yeah, you do. Dried it's or fine. fresh. They're fine. Yeah. So here's the here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Okay, you know. Oh, I okay. just what, no. You I'm know. not saying I know all about all of everything, but <laughs> you know the desire to control. Okay, I will put this like we're going to the moon with Newton again. Okay, Newton. But you're not going to the moon with Artemis. Whatever. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going. But 1600s physics that thought space and time were separate things that only works uh, on the Earth to the planets, but doesn't really ex- wouldn't uh, have anything explanation for gravitational lensing, wouldn't have any explanation for all sorts of phenomena that general relativity uh, brought about. GPS wouldn't work under Newtonian physics, but it was enough to get you to the moon. You have the mushroom that does the effect with all the components together. And it dosage-wise, there's not like an overdose of this particular uh, thing. I mean, there's, there's a reasonable dose that you can take, which is a, whatever that, you know, number of mushrooms. You don't have to have it calculated out to the exact, you know, number of molars of a molecule in this for it to have the effect. You've got the good enough to get to the moon, to do the therapies, to, to use them in that scenario, it doesn't necessarily need to be the way that we dose out everything. You know, to use it in therapies, you've already got a thing that works. Just eat the mushroom. Just, so you can work on it. You can work on it. FDA a lot of people is yeah, the only FDA, thing. Yeah, yeah. Our, our medical practices and public health are not necessarily going to work that way. But, you know. No. You do, no, you, but, Justin. Well, <laughs> well, this is like, if, if this is the thing holding back clinical trials and therapeutic trials, then that's ridiculous. You, you, you should, you've got the thing that will get you, you've got the physics that it's, will get you to the moon. It's not the thing, but people are working on a lot of things going in parallel. I, yeah, mean, yeah, I think of course, that, of that is the, that's the essential message is that this is another direction of study, really determining how these compounds impact the brain, what nerves are stimulated, how are they stimulated, and looking, trying to figure out from a bottom-up perspective of you know, how these effects actually happen to impact psychology. How well, and you happen? need to know, you need to know those, those basic pieces, not just for dosage, but also to know like counterindications. <laughs> if you're going well, to prescribe mushrooms you'd love to, to someone. No, I'm, yeah, I'm going to say yes, but there are a lot of pharmaceutical drugs that we dose out to people without really knowing exactly how they work Fair either. Yes. So, yeah. you know, yeah. just get, and in theory, it would there. be nice, I guess. And, and, and you're anytime... going to try to turn the tables on a on a narrative around a substance it is helpful to have this information right but it's also this, and this is going to yes. be true of uh antidepressants antipsychotics and any psychotropic drug that exists regardless of dosage it's almost meaningless in comparison to the effect it has on the individual and their and their brain so that's a whole mystery unto of itself that can be solved and looked at but but they don't, Individual even with the same complexity. dosage, they don't operate the same on every brain. And so that's a, that's why that's a whole, 
It, that's why I'm saying it almost doesn't matter. You're going to get your rocket to where it needs to go. Just go. Don't worry about the fact you don't need GPS. You're the only. You're yeah, just landing I just think somewhere. Less people, are gonna, less people are going to get <laughs> on the Justin rocket if life. they don't know how the rocket works. I think yeah. that's that's the other thing. Right? Hey, you have just buy your ticket. You buy your ticket for the rocket and you take the ride. And that's all there is right. to it. There are some people who will do that. And there are some people who need to know <laughs> a, lot of people are gonna a little that. bit more information. You can wait forever Speaking, for that answer. All right. Okay. Final, final story <laughs> out of the University <laughs> of Maryland. Researchers who uh, have been looking at, you know, an area of the brain thought to be involved in consciousness. Francis Crick said, this is the seat of consciousness. This is the thing that's important. And researchers are like, yeah, okay, big neurons. The clostrum, the clostrum, this part of the brain, that's the thing. It's important for consciousness. And out of the University of Maryland, researchers are like, well, no, maybe you're actually wrong. Maybe. Francis Crick was not a uh, yeah. brain site neurologist, by the way. Yeah, he, he studied so DNA. He had, yeah, yeah. Actually, anyway. he kind of collected other people's studying of DNA. But uh, that's fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, these researchers conducted a series of experiments on animals and people to turn off the clostrum. Um, Turned it off in mice, not in people. The mice did not lose consciousness, kept <laughs> doing what they were Obviously doing, stuff. acting normally. So the researchers took the mice and were like, okay, we're going to give you a simple task, and then we're going to do a harder task, and then see what happens when the claustrum mm. is turned off. And so what they determined is that the mice were less able to perform the difficult task when the claustrum was turned off than the simple task. So simple tasks, hmm. easy, uh, claustrum wasn't involved. Maybe the claustrum's involved in these more complex tasks. They did fMRI, uh, fMRI studies on healthy vol volunteers. Again, simple versus complicated mental tasks. The claustrum became activated in these volunteers when complicated tasks were involved. So uh, what we are seeing and what these researchers have concluded is that the claustrum isn't necessarily the seat of consciousness but more a network router and the claustrum is important for helping like similar to how i was thinking about the hippocampus involved in information going to different networks for memory formation the claustrum is important for making sure information is going to correct networks to make sure actions can take place yeah. so the claustrum is like our brain's network router it's network router. i kind of like that i the the, uh, the impression i got was it was like uh, ikea and in instructions to put together the furniture so <laughs> not not the seat of human consciousness no but uh just a more stepwise way of doing things in the right order the simple tasks are fine but as soon as you get like oh i I got 15 of these little pieces that got to go together, probably in the right order. Now yes. I need my instructions. Now I got to, got to look it up. Yes. In my, so in my, through my, when, router, when you have brain. issues and that Ikea instruction manual is giving you problems, uh, you know, that's when your claustrum is probably active. <laughs> so claustrum, not necessarily seat of our consciousness, but our brain's network router. And when you're like, oh, I can't do this task, bah, just blame your claustrum. Mm -hmm. Say my claustrum's not working, teacher. I'm Noted. sorry. <laughs> it's, I can't wait to tell my boss that and for her to be like, you're what? You're what? <laughs> <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking I'm about? I'm sorry, my claustrum is just not up for the task today. Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, so this is a new, This they have a new model proposing that the frontal cortices of our brain direct the claustrum to flexibly instantiate cortical networks to subserve cognitive control. I love my subservient... Yeah. Hmm. flexible cortical hmm. networks let's go have we done it 
Did we make it to the end of the show? Kiki, you had a story towards the beginning about a black hole. Oh, I did. Do you want me to talk about a black hole? Yeah, just real quick, because the headline... I'm interested. Yes. Okay. Okay. I was I was keeping it keeping it to a to a download. All right. Just, just give case, me like but... the two sentence version. I'm just very curious. Two sentence version. <laughs> uh, researchers have created a very tiny synthetic black hole in a laboratory, and so this is University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, they uh, created this this little tiny black hole and they have a fake event horizon and mm -hmm. on this fake event horizon they were able to uh, produce a rise in temperature that matched theoretical expectations of an equivalent black hole system but only when part of the chain extended beyond the event horizon and so that this means this could be an entanglement of particles straddling the event horizon which would be a big part of generating Hawking radiation. So what they have created in the laboratory could be a model system for studying Hawking radiation that is posited to be the way that uh, energy is released from black holes uh, in the universe. Or, or it would have been had the black hole not sucked <laughs> all of the researchers into yeah, the experiment, right, never right. to be seen again. Is that all the data again. lost? Is, is that, is that the, the internet issues that you're experiencing over there in Denver? Yes. I mean, you're closer to the... Yeah. Oh, yeah, a yeah. little too close to the event horizon. Now. Gosh darn left. And, and the information isn't holes. lost. The information isn't lost. It's there on the exterior of the... It doesn't matter. Hey, I think we did it. I think we got to the end of another great show. We did. We did. I'm just going to have to spend several hours reading about how you create a black hole in a lab because I don't get it. <laughs> I think you go pew pew with the gold particles or something. Oh, I don't know. okay. I haven't it. done it in a got long it. time. Okay, pew, never mind. Pew, pew, we figured it pew, out. Pew, pew, pew. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. Whew, we made it all the way to the end. And I really, really want to say thank you to people who help with the show. Thank you, Fada, for all of your help with social media and with show notes. And thank you, Identity4, for, for recording the show. Thank you, Gord, Aaron Lore, and all others who help keep our chat rooms wonderful places to hang out. And Rachel, thank you so much for editing the show. Finally, thank you to our Patreon sponsors. We really cannot do this program without you. So thank you to Teresa Smith, James Schaefer, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazarb, Ralph E. Figueroa, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Woody M.S., Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vagard, Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Gaurav Sharma, Reagan, Derek Schmidt, Don Mundus, Stephen Almiron, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fredus 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Matt Bass, I hope people voted Beto for Texas, but it didn't. I don't know. John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflo, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day flying out, Christopher Dreyer, Dreyer Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul Rock, Rick Ramis, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, Adam Mishkan, E.O., Kevin Parashan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Peccaro, Tony Steele, and Jason Roberts. <laughs> Thank you all for your support on Patreon. And if you would like to help us out on Patreon, please head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link on next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels. And again, Thursday at 5 a.m. Central European time. Want to listen to us as a podcast? <laughs> Just search for This Week in Science or wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. And you can also sign up for our newsletter. You can also contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist 
TWIS in the subject line or your email will be spam filtered into a lab grown black hole and my classroom will not be able to figure out how to get it out. But the information won't be lost. The information will not be lost. You can always retrieve that information that you want by contacting us at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie on Twitter for now. We love your feedback. If there is a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... Twist calendars are coming. Twist calendars are coming. And it's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand this week science is coming your way so everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 science I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just get understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy Trying to threaten your philosophy Blah, 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 blah. So, Blair. Yes. Yes. Um, so, uh, calendar. Mm-hmm. Yes. I, um, I tried to get it all put together and put a link. And for some reason, the link going from uh, the twist.org website at the moment says nope. And so I'm working on the link to make it happen. I wonder if Zazzle wants to uh, review it first. They may want to review it first. Because that does happen uh, sometimes. Here, yes, let me... Clickers. There's yeah, a calendar me... there, and it wants to be added to a cart, but... Yeah, so anyway, I'm working on making sure that it is available, but the ca- there is a calendar uh, up in Zazzle, Zazzle, and it will be available as a link on the website very soon. This Zazzle calendar does not have all the sciencey holidays on it, unfortunately, but um, we do have, um, it's beautiful. Blair, this calendar is absolutely gorgeous. I think it's Thank like you. one of the best calendars ever. Yes. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, but we will also have, uh, eventually we're gonna have a PDF that will have all this science holidays on it. So you can download your own and print your own calendar uh, that that will be available. So we're going to make those two things available, um, depending on you know, what you want, what you get. And then we, we also may have a, a special offer for Patreon. Yes. Maybe. Yes. Okay. And we may have, yes. And I was, I was triple, triple, Triple offers. It's getting to be a lot, and it's confusing. I just don't want to confuse people. You yes. know, just want to make it make it easy and good for everyone. But uh, Zazzle, this calendar is in the Zazzle account currently, and we're just trying to make the link available on yeah, the Twist website. On. But um, yeah, let me see. What about this? Can you see the stars? Yeah, and no is longer it available. Star? Right. Yes, why okay. isn't it available? Strange. What's going on? Okay. So if you yeah, know how to fix just... it and make it go, then maybe I messed something up. I don't know. No. 
2023 calendar. Let's it's see. a beautiful Edit calendar. Deep. It's so good. Let's see. <sighs> Title, Marketplace Department. I have the rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, click all those buttons. All options. Um, public rated G done. Oh, categories. Choose a store yeah, maybe that's category. I don't know these things. Zazzle confuses me sometimes. <sighs> I'm sorry, noodles. We don't want you being sad. We're really trying, really trying. Why is Noodles sad? Because he would try and buy the calendar and then oh. couldn't. And it got, it got sad. I would be sad too. It's like, look, there's a link on the website. And then it's like, sorry. No. Uh. Yeah. But anyway, uh, hopefully within the next 24 hours, we'll get this thing going. Um, <sighs> but we did it. We made a show. Blair, I know you have to go and... Um, oh, did I do it? Did you do it? Is it I, done? I have, to, I have to log out. Don't admit it. Uh, you're live on air. Whatever you did. <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, you guys got hard outs. So I will, uh, I will uh, nope. thank the audience for uh, being here. And I'll say, say goodnight, Blair. Goodnight, Blair. Say goodnight, Justin. Can't. Good morning, Justin. Say good morning, Justin. Good morning, Justin. Good, good night, night, Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode. And uh, for sure, by next week, there's going to be calendars, 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 calendars. Hopefully, I know you've been like saving tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, we're trying. Technology's hard sometimes. All right. Thank you all. I hope you stay safe, stay healthy, and stay curious until next week. We'll see you then. Bye.